Thank you all. Kia ora tato. Um, I'm not sure how the time's going to go. What I'm about to show you is very broadly based on a presentation I gave about three weeks ago at the International Federation of Television Archives conference in Amsterdam. Um, and the, the process we're going to uh, go through today uh, is more or less unique. Uh, there are uh, similarly scaled or larger scaled digitization and collection development and preservation projects around the world in the audiovisual area, um, but not ones of anything like the scale which are like the scope. In other words, ones which encompass an entire national screen and audio culture. Um, altogether, there are large television collections, there are large audio collections being digitized, uh, but very few instances where those things are coming together with the aim of making some kind of coherent whole. Um, and uh, I was speaking to the next presenter and discussing my, my dress today. Um, this whole process starts with a political imperative, uh, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, and uh, as you can see by the way I'm dressed, uh, I myself am subject from time to time to political imperatives. Uh, and uh, right after this presentation, I'm actually going to go and meet some politicians just to keep it real. Um, but uh, where I'd like to begin is on launch day, or in fact launch eve, of Nga Taonga Sound and Vision, uh, when the then Minister of Broadcasting, Craig Foss, uh, gave a brief but impassioned speech uh, that, amongst other things, laid down this challenge. Uh, and uh, it's, it's easy to say, but uh, it encompasses an enormous amount of detail within this very simple overall command. So our question was, you know, could we do it? How could we do it? Could we do it better? Um, in order to make some kind of start on that, we had to break that down to some degree. And I've broken today's presentation down into two parts, uh, which is more or less how our rational rationalisation went. First part is in order to do that, we have to integrate. We have to actually bring together three organisations, three collections, three very distinct ways of doing things. Uh, in order to make a national collection. And as, uh, let's say, a, a given, although others may contest it, uh, we're going to do that in the digital world. It is not really meaningful anymore to try to do that in the analogue world. Um, and I will say also that with this presentation and with the task, it seems to me that the further ahead we look in these kind of projects, the harder it is to make out the detail. And I think you'll find the detail gets fuzzier and fuzzier as we go along. I make no apology for that. Um, so the second part of the task really is, is it rhymes, which is handy, uh, but that's to curate. In other words, having, having passed that first milestone, that really just gives us an undifferentiated mass of data. And that in itself is not an accessible collection. And what are we going to do to make it accessible, both in terms of process and an outcome. It has to be made accessible. It can't just simply exist on servers or on tapes. So we start with the most obvious thing. We have three organisations, three cultures, as I said. Um, very briefly, you all know, well, probably know all three of these, certainly, almost certainly know two of them uh, quite well. Radio New Zealand, uh, established as a bro state broadcaster many years ago established an archive along the way for its own purposes um, and had got to the point in the lifespan of that archive where it was no longer intrinsic in the broadcaster's business. And you could say something similar about TVNZ, a rather different path, a rather more commercial focus, but nonetheless had reached the point where it was no longer considering an analogue tape-based archive as part of its core business. Um, in both cases, their archives were outliers, physically removed from the mothership, uh, and at some distance, you have to say, from the centre of power. The film archive, on the other hand, uh, smaller by far than either the Radio New Zealand or, the, or Television New Zealand, but on the other hand, solely focused on archiving. Uh, so for us, archiving is at the centre, for the other two, at the periphery. Now, here's a quick, rather cartoony look at the collections that we're dealing with. Uh, and you can see the profiles are quite different. The film archive, quite apart from the different media, um, as a focused archival institution, has made very substantial inroads into cataloguing and digitising its collection. The sound archives, Radio New Zealand, uh, had done a reasonable job of those things, 
but digitization has only just got underway in the last year or so following the transfer to uh, the film archives control. Uh, Television New Zealand, on the other hand, massive collection, uh, quite a lot of cataloguing, maybe in a rather eccentric and broadcaster-focused way, um, <coughs> but in effect, no digitization. So we have a collection there, of, hard to count, but around 650,000 titles, items, it's a slippery word, um, but none of those exist in an accessible file form. Now, just for the purpose of this exercise, there is a debate to be had about whether preservation and digitization are strictly equivalent, and we're not going to have it. Uh, going through this process today, I'm going to use the word digitization as more or less interchangeable with <coughs> preservation for practical reasons. It really does represent the best shot in 2014. Um, these things reach the reach public. You can argue how accessible some of them are. Um, they reach the public through broadcasting, obviously enough. That's uncounted and quite difficult to count at this stage. Uh, and then there's a whole lot of non-broadcast uh, outlets, out, outlets as well, which are essentially the film archives model. So we have, uh, there are websites involved that are managed by us. Uh, we have a series through the country, I think currently 17 off-site access points in museums and libraries called MediaNet. They're server-based. Uh, we have, we provide links uh, to a number of other online providers such as Tiara and so on. Uh, we have physical venues, so we do screenings and other sorts of presentations, exhibitions and so on around the country, uh, including uh, you know, community level activity of, of all kinds. Uh, and we loan material so that a number of uh, either real space or online providers access the collection and use it in their programs as well. And altogether that adds up to about 800,000 non-broadcast users a year, so a pretty substantial audience already, but only accessing, in that big picture, a very small part of the collection. If we simply bring those uh, three collections together, uh, just count them as one big pile, those three graphs turn into that graph. And you can see there pretty clearly the size of the gap between the total collection number and the digital portion of it. However, it's easy it is to draw that, that isn't the same as combining the collections. They are still very distinctly separate. They're in separate physical spaces, on separate media, and so on. So, looking again at the collections in a different way, how do we know what we know about them? Well, essentially through databases. Uh, and once again, there are three different cultures, three very different platforms here that we're working with. Uh, and significant amounts of information over the whole collection, it's not on databases at all. Uh, if we're lucky, it's on spreadsheets, and in some cases, it is still on good old-fashioned index cards. The content on those uh, records, call them, uh, is also very different from institution to institution. What a broadcaster has thought of as valuable to capture about their holdings is quite different from what a public archive might or a public user might. Uh, so there's a lot of information, for example, in the uh, Television New Zealand database, uh, shot by shot around news and current affairs. If you want a picture of John Key holding onto his tie and looking to the left, you can find it. Uh, this is not necessarily value for money in trying to catalogue a collection this large overall. Another thing to bear in mind is that uh, this is still largely an analogue collection. And uh, while librarians may struggle with some of the differences between bound books and large scale uh, printed objects and photographs and so on, the landscape is far more challenging in the audiovisual area. This is just a short list, believe it or not, of the different kinds of technologies and formats that exist in the collections, some of them in very large numbers. Um, and I think the thing that is particularly pressing about this is that each one of those formats needs an entirely different and unique form of player technology. So it's all very well to count up how many high band umatic beans you have, but high band umatics are only worth more than a bean if you can actually get a high band umatic machine to play it. Um, and we're talking about huge numbers here. So this is just an estimate, 
But for example, if we go to those eumatics, um, we need to have, roughly speaking, 10,000 hours of play time to get through that pile of eumatic tapes. Now, we have about four or five, depending on whether the wind's blowing the right way, high functioning pneumatic machines left. Each of those machines uh, uses contact magnetic heads on tape, those wear out. No one in the world has manufactured those heads for the last 10 to 15 years. There is a distinctly finite resource of pneumatic play heads. Uh, we might have, hard to say at this point, two, three thousand hours, if we're lucky, of playtime left on our current stock of machines. This is reproduced across virtually all of those formats, these kinds of equations. So you can see that the job doesn't only involve dealing with a lot of videotapes, it actually involves a very deep investment in totally obsolete technology. Uh, and one thing I'll say about that is that uh, that creates pressures and drivers on a preservation process uh, which are quite separate from content. If you have a pile of tapes which are themselves beginning to degenerate, you have an urgency about preserving them which might override, it certainly will compete with the, uh, the public interest in the content of those tapes. If you're faced with the thought of either providing an audience member with what they want or, or and as a result, consigning some unique material to perpetual oblivion, it's a difficult choice. I won't bother actually doing the sums behind this particular piece of arithmetic. Um, we have to do these sums involving those machines, their time, the human time. Basically, nothing in the collection can be transferred any faster than its original playing time. In most cases, it takes a great deal longer to prepare, repair, uh, and deal with that transfer, so the productivity rates can be a lot lower. Some things can be done simultaneously, but just taking this particular algorithm, or well, it's not even that really, uh, equation, uh, it looks like that pile of work I described before is about 23 calendar years for eight people working full time. Now, really nobody has 23 years to wait, least of all the Minister of Broadcasting. Um, However, it's not just about the content. We go back to this again, um, and I made some comments about how different parts of this uh, have been compiled in different ways. So the, ob the object here will be to actually investigate all the data, the metadata that's been captured, um, select the useful and compatible parts of it, uh, and migrate it. So if we do that, and we take those elements from each one, um, and we add to it the media from the digitization process and the metadata which is created in the digitization process and makes it possible for us to meaningfully use that material afterwards to find it, uh, reproduce it, play it and so on. We have a new, is it an object? A new element which we're calling a tuple. Now a tuple, I'm not a mathematician, uh, but a tuple is a real word. Uh, and uh, it's applied, I'm told, by mathematicians, uh, particularly to re relational databases where it represents a set of value attributes. So it's more or less equivalent to a record in a standard non-relational database or catalogue. We have to create a new tuple for every element that we put into this new merged collection. We have to migrate not just material, uh, data, vi video, whatever, out of old analogue forms. We have to migrate data along with it. Then what? Well, we have to make some choices. Now, if you're a politician, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, you just take the whole collection, you catalogue it, you digitise it, you're done. But as we've seen, that's a 23-year prospect at best. Could well be a great deal longer if things go wrong, and heaven knows they probably will. So we have to look at some pragmatic outcomes. So. Um, I'm suggesting for our planning that we look ahead about as far as we realistically can, which is about three years, which happens to dovetail with the Minister's own uh, useful instruction. Where will we be at the Minister's deadline? Well, if we work away at about that productivity rate I indicated, uh, and the collection doesn't grow too much, and I hope TV3 is not you know, 
lining, revving up the trucks right now, um, if it just grows at a containable rate uh, through new production and, and, and deposits, then it'll look a bit like this in three years' time. So if we combine existing digital items, work we've already done, newborn digital items that come into the collection, and the migration output over those three years, we get to there, which is about 17% of the collection digitised. It's a huge number. It's 150,000 titles, items, uh, made digital or, or, or d delivered initially as digital. Um, huge number, far more than the Minister's target to put online, far more than we would be able or I think want to put online. It will contain a whole lot of material preserved for those reasons I said before, reasons of, of degeneration or loss of technology or whatever, rather than content. Um, so it will be a very varied, a very broad church, a critical mass. And what we have to do is work within that and make some choices. This badly drawn thing uh, is the familiar long tail curve, known as the Pareto curve, I'm told, um, and the basis for Amazon.com's business model, I'm also told. Um, and this is, this is used in all kinds of ways to basically estimate where activity will happen over a body of work. So this could be a collection, a stock in, a, in an online bookshop or whatever. And one fundamental part of that is the idea that um, about 20% of given stock in, a, in Amazon, for example, or in a bookshop in Whitcalls, uh, will attract about 80% of the demand. This is a sort of a, a truism of marketing and planning. If we take that particular ratio and apply it to our collection, we find that's about 30,000 items. So we're actually you know, looking, if we were to somehow choose the 20% of the greatest public interest out of our critical mass, we would have a body which actually overachieves uh, Minister Foss's target by a considerable amount, 30,000 items. That's a lot of films, television programs, radio programs, pieces of music, and so on, and it's less than 4% of the collection. Let's just do an exercise of saying, well, what might you put in that to make up? There's a guess, just a guess, uh, of what a nationally, sorry, a national collection made accessible at these kinds of sampling rates, what it might contain by those sorts of measures. Once again, it's a tiny proportion of the collection, but it's a huge quantity for these kinds of projects. So just to give you one scale comparison, the entire history of New Zealand feature filmmaking has produced a tad now, I think, over 300 feature films. We're talking about 7,500 films of which feature films would make up that very small proportion. Um, there are other similar projects around the world, the BFI and, and others uh, are trying to do things like this, and they are typically dealing in maybe a tenth of the quantity we're talking about here. So these are very ambitious targets, however small they are within the context of the whole collection. Um, how are we going to do it? And this is where we're starting to get into that slightly more fuzzy long-range detail. Um, we need to harness a whole lot of, of inputs to do that. We need our own staff expertise, and there's an awful lot of knowledge in all three archives about what's in the collection and what's interesting and valuable about that. We need to actually use our, the, the feedback of our professional users, so that is, um, that's the production industry reusing material, it's researchers, scholars, uh, filmmakers, and so on. We need to use uh, targeted audience research, we need to actually go out and, and question people about what they would want from such uh, a service, which 4% of the collection actually is of most interest. Uh, we need to use, once we get rolling, crowdsourcing techniques to test some of these, uh, these assumptions and, and speculative moves of getting stuff up in the first place. And being the kind of organisation we are, which is uh, not just hemmed in by, but genuinely respectful of uh, copyright and, and a whole lot of other interests held in the collection by, by the subjects and, and so on, um, we need to work within a framework of rights and permissions. All those things have to be brought together in order to give us confidence about our choices. The upside is our margins of error are quite good. When we're dealing with 30,000, 
you can be liberal about the feedback from a, a professional user. If some particular barrow pusher really, really, really wants to do something about trams, well, there's room in there for trams. Um, we looked earlier at these, oops, they've gone pale on, uh, at these existing outlets, and most of those, if not all of them, I think are still uh, relevant and will still persist into the digital future. Most of them, in fact all of them really, actually rely on digital technology anyway. Even our live presentations, if we go to a church hall uh, in Hokitika, uh, we are actually presenting a digital experience. It may still be on a hard wooden seat, on a bed sheet on the wall, but fundamentally it's got there now because of digital technology. Um, but we have to go beyond these things. Uh, I think the first thing we have to do is these num confront these numbers and be realistic, that you don't deliver those kinds of very large scale access through any of the existing tools that we have in this country. There are some examples around the world, like the BBC's iPlayer uh, and uh, a French national institution called INA, where they are delivering on a very large scale, and those things are built essentially to do one thing, which is to deliver content as directly uh, and as unfiltered as possible to an audience on these kind of scales. They're essentially databases <laughs> full of media. Um, there are some very specific audiences that we already engage with in various ways that I think that uh, who could be incorporated into this much bigger delivery. Uh, education is just one of those, but it's a key one, I think, and one likely to uh, be supported financially and politically. We have the world of curated websites. For example, the Naotonga themselves uh, in April next year, we will launch, uh, in conjunction with the National Film and Sound Archive in Australia, an ANZAC website to commemorate World War I. A much smaller, tighter focused uh, device entirely than a $30,000, 30,000, sorry, <laughs> I wish, 30,000 item uh, database. Uh, there are existing curated websites such as New Zealand On Air, so New Zealand On Screen, and so on, who would also benefit through this, through getting the ability to have more tightly focused uh, but richer content. Uh, and then there's the question of other platforms, and I'm going to leave this here now. Uh, it's a challenge that everyone in the archival community is wrestling with. You know, what is the point of building these things when we already have YouTube? Are we actually just empire building, or should we really go with the flow, follow the audience to the existing platforms, and put our collections through those platforms to the wider public. And that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, quick questions from the floor. We've got one over, two over there. Probably have to leave it at those two questions, I think. Oh, hi, Frank. Um, Tess from NZ on screen. Um, my question is around the collaboration, especially on the last one around using existing channels. Um, your input's are interesting that there wasn't a, a mention of collaboration with existing platforms. Um, I was looking at the stress you said that TVNZ, you said zero digitised when we have hundreds of not thousands digitised. It would be just sort of great to sort of get your feeling for how you can work with other organisations such as NZ on screen, audio culture, national library, etc. And not just on the content, but also on the technology as well. Is there something else that we can share, share or collaborate on? Be interested in here. Um, just winding back, the, the comments on the, uh, the, the collection and the digitisation, that is what is held within the TVNZ collection. So while there are digital iterations of many TVNZ uh, programmes hither and thither, uh, none of them are actually in the TVNZ archive. They have not retained one file through all the work that's been done. So that's a big challenge for us. Um, moving on to collaboration, I mean, nothing in this presentation specifies how that is going to play out. It certainly doesn't in any way rule it out. It simply focuses on our immediate housekeeping, if I can call it that, uh, task of dealing with these absolutely enormous numbers and how are we going to do that and how are we going to get up to industrial scale, which is what the political expectation is. Um, 
we we're getting told we can't get that content at all because there's a new channel coming. And I find that distressing when there's so much to be digitised that you that it's not an open where we could be in a situation where we can collaborate together on that. I think some of the I mean I, this is a very big question. I mean I probably can't really do much about it today, but um, you know, part of that comes down to the observation I made pretty briefly at the beginning about conflating preservation and digitization just for the purpose of this. Our focus is a preservation one, so that, for example, if we're not too technical, uh, when we have a, a high band pneumatic tape, uh, what we need to do is to turn that into a 10 bit uncompressed uh, video file so it is preserved. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, we have to set up a digitization factory essentially. Now, um, the current activity around things like web use and so on tends to focus on much more convenient pocket-sized codecs which, which work well for that kind of use but which do not provide preservation. And there's a real huge hazard in all of this that if we do not immediately get on to proper preservation by digital means, then the means to future-proof even those digital files will go. So we have a big focus at the moment uh, on preservation by digital means. There will undoubtedly be, for anybody, uh, major access outfalls from that. Once you have your 10 bit uncompressed file, then it's quite possible to make it in any iteration you choose for H.264, for this year's web fashion, or for something else for next year. So that, that, that is really the driver behind all the arithmetic here. Just none of that, I have to re emphasize, is in any way a comment on willingness to collaborate. It's just the reality of the preservation job, and nobody else in any way is equipped to do that. Uh, we came into TVNZ thinking they had been doing it to discover that they had. They'd been copying uh, analog material to DigiMeter, which doesn't actually get us any further on towards true digitization. So we've got a really, really serious issue around preservation to address and to make that clear. Okay, uh, if Simon's got a question that he thinks has a quick answer, throw it out, otherwise that will be the last one. No, I, what you're you know, leaving me out. It doesn't mean we're going to dispose of anything, but I think we have to, given that um, the legacy databases have very, very specific, in the case of TVNZ, particularly commercially sensitive information on them, they would not form part of a public database in the future. That data won't be thrown away, apart from anything else, TVNZ themselves will be retaining it for their own purposes. Okay. Thank you very much. So thanks to Frank for that presentation, and also thank you for throwing us a party for after the event. Uh, don't forget that the official after party is down the road on Taranaki Street at uh, Ngā Taonga headquarters um, and there'll be drinks and nibbles followed by a screening of sleeping dogs from, so uh, after party from 5, screening from 6.30 down there. Make sure you, if you're going to attend that, take your conference name badge to get entry to the film. <laughs>